It is the last day of fourth grade. Not the way we anticipated it would be, but we've made it nevertheless. Uh, I've got Moosey here to read with us today. We've got some candlelight going, a real candle since I'm at my house. Um, but I did spend some time at school today cleaning out your desks, so I am glad that we cleaned them before you left so I didn't have a whole big mess. Um, but I got a bunch of my candles back and it was just fun thinking about you guys reading with the candles and I just miss you guys a lot. All right, we are going to finish up the chapter we were reading, and then I will read one more chapter for us today. I may be repeating a little bit here, but that'll help us catch up with what we were reading last time. For a long time, I lay on the rock while they trotted around below me. Remember, these are the wild dogs that are coming after her. The rock was high and they could not climb it, but I was still fearful. As I lay there, I wondered what would happen to me if I went against the law of our tribe which forbade the making of weapons by women, if I did not think of it at all and made those things which I must have to protect myself. Now, think a minute. This story did take place in a different culture and a different time. So some of the things that we kind of take for granted that we have now um, as a woman, a long time ago women didn't have the rights women have today. The same thing with different races of people, people from different cultures. So you have to look at this from a historian's mind. So. In her tribe, women did not make weapons. They had different roles than men, kind of like the tribes we read about this year from Indiana. So she has to choose now, will she follow her cultural boundaries or will she survive? So I think I know what I would choose. Would the four winds blow in from the four directions of the world and smother me if I made weapons? Or would the earth tremble, as many said, and bury me beneath its falling rocks? Or as others said, would the sea rise over the island in a terrible flood? Would the weapons break in my hands at the moment when my life was in danger, which is what my father had said? I thought about these things for two days, and on the third night, when the wild dogs returned to the rock, I made up my mind that no matter what befell me, I would make the weapons. In the morning, I set about it, though I felt very fearful. I wish to use a sea elephant's tusk for the tip of the spear, because it is hard and it is the right shape. There are many of these animals on the shore near my camp, but I lacked a weapon with which to kill one. Our men usually hunted them with a strong net made of bull kelp, which they threw over an animal while it slept. To do this, at least three men were needed, and even then the sea elephant often dragged the net into the sea and got away. I used instead the root of a tree, which I shaped into a point and hardened in the fire. This I bound to a long shaft with the green spit sinews of a seal I killed with a rock. All right, so some of you, um, I know specifically my group at the Feast of the Hunter's Moon, we got to see some sinew, and it is made from uh, animal parts. That's as far as we'll go, but it is a really strong material. So before you had stores to go to to buy things, if you needed something strong, you could use sinew. Okay. The bows and arrows took more time and caused me great difficulty. I had a bowstring, but wood, which could be bent, I'm sorry, I had a bowstring, but wood which could be bent and yet had the proper strength was not easy to find. I searched the ravines for several days before I found it, trees being very scarce on the island of the blue dolphins. Wood for the arrows was easier to find, and also the stone for the tips and the feathers for the ends of the shafts. Gathering these things was not the most of the trouble. I had seen the weapons made, but I knew little about it. I had seen my father sitting in the hut on winter nights, scraping the wood for the shafts, chipping the, the stones for the tips, and tying the feathers. Yet I had watched him and really seen nothing. I had watched, but not with the eye of one who would ever do it. For this reason, it took many days, and I had many failures before I fashioned a bow and arrows that could be used. Wherever I went now, whether to the shore when I gathered shellfish, or to the ravine for water, I carried this weapon in a sling on my back. I practiced with it and also with the spear. The dogs did not come to the camp during the time I was making the weapons, though every night I could hear them howling. Once, after the weapons were made, I saw the leader of the pack, the one with the gray hair and the yellow eyes, watching me from the brush. I had gone to the ravine for water, and he stood on the hill above the spring looking down at me. He stood very quiet with only his head showing over the top of a chala bush. He was too far away for me to reach him with the arrow. 
Wherever I went during the day, I felt secure with my new weapons, and I waited patiently for the time when I could use them against the wild dogs that had killed Ramo. I did not go to the cave where they, had ha where they had had their lair, since I was sure that they would soon come to the camp. Yet every night, I climbed onto the rock to sleep. After the first night I spent there, which was uncomfortable because of the uneven places in the rock, I carried dried seaweed up from the beach and made a bed for myself. So I just had a text-to-text -text connection. Um, I hope you think about Sam Gribbley an awful lot while we read this. They're similar stories, but they're in different places. So they had to adapt to their environments in very different ways. So Sam Gribbley definitely didn't have seaweed. Okay. It was a pleasant place to stay there on the headland. The stars were bright overhead and I lay and counted the ones that I knew and gave names to many that I did not know. In the morning, the gulls flew out from their nests in the crevices of the cliff. They circled down to the tide pools, where they stood first on one leg and then on the other, splashing water over themselves and combing their feathers with curved beaks. Then they flew off down the shore to look for food. Beyond the kelp beds, pelicans were already hunting, soaring high over the clear water, diving straight down, if they sighted a fish, to strike the sea with a great splash that I could hear. I also watched the otter hunting in the kelp. These shy little animals had come back soon after the Aleuts had left, and now there seemed to be as many of them as before. The early morning sun shone like gold on their glossy pelts. Yet as I lay there on the high rock, looking at the stars, I thought about the ship which belonged to the white men. And at dawn, as light spread across the sea, my first glance was toward the little harbor of Coral Cove. Every morning I would look for the ship there, thinking that it might have come in the night. And each morning I would see nothing except the birds flying over the sea. When there were people in Galasset, I was always up before the sun and busy with many things. But now that there was little to do, I did not leave the rock until the sun was high. I would eat and then go to the spring and take a bath in the warm water. Afterwards, I went down to the shore where I could gather a few abalones and sometimes spear a fish for my supper. Before darkness fell, I climbed onto the rock and watched the sea until it slowly disappeared in the night. The ship did not come, and thus winter passed in the spring. Chapter 10. Summer is the best time on the island of the Blue Dolphins. The sun is warm then, and the winds blow milder out of the west, sometimes out of the south. It was during these days that the ship might return, and now I spent most of my time on the rock, looking out from the high headland into the east, toward the country where my people had gone, across the sea that was never ending. Once while I watched a small object, which I took to be a ship, but, but, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Once while I watched, I saw a small object, which I took to be the ship, but a stream of water rose from it, and I knew that it was a whale spouting. During those summer days, I saw nothing else. The first storm of winter ended my hopes. If the white men's ships were coming for me, it would have come during the good time of summer. Now I would have to wait until winter was gone, maybe longer. The thought of being alone on the island while so many suns rose from the sea and went slowly back into the sea filled my heart with loneliness. I had not felt so lonely before because I was sure that the ship would return as Matasip had said it would. Now my hopes were dead. Now I was really alone. I could not eat much, nor could I sleep without dreaming terrible dreams. The storm blew out of the north, sending big waves against the island and winds so strong that I was unable to stay on the rock. I moved my bed to the foot of the rock and for protection, kept a fire going throughout the night. I slept there five times. The first night the dogs came and stood outside the ring made by the fire. I killed three of them with arrows, but not the leader, and they did not come again. On the sixth day, when the storm had ended, I went to the place where the canoes had been hidden and let myself down over the cliff. This part of the shore was sheltered from the wind, and I found the canoes just as, it, just as they had been left. The dried food was still good, and the water was stale, so I went back to the spring and filled a fresh basket. I had decided during the days of the storm, when I had given up hope of seeing the ship, that I would take one of the canoes and go to the country that lay toward the east. I remembered how Kimki, before he had gone, had asked the advice of his ancestors who had lived many ages in the past, who had come to the island from that country, and likewise the advice of Zuma, the medicine man who held power over the wind and the seas. But these things I could not do, for Zuma had been killed by the Aleuts, and in all my life I had never been able to speak with the dead, though many times I had tried. 
Yet I cannot say that I was really afraid as I stood there on the shore. I knew that my ancestors had crossed the sea in their canoes, coming from that place which lay beyond. Kim Ki too had crossed the sea. I was not nearly so skilled with the canoe as these men, but I must say that whatever might befall me on the endless waters did not trouble me. It meant far less than the thought of staying on the island alone, without a home or companions, pursued by wild dogs, where everything reminded me of those who were dead and those who had gone away. Of the four canoes stored there against the cliff, I chose the smallest, which was still very heavy because it could carry six people. The task that faced me was to push it down the rocky shore and into the water, a distance four or five times its length. This I did by first removing all the large rocks in front of the canoe. I then filled in all these holes with pebbles and along this path laid down long strips of kelp, long strips of kelp, making it a slippery bed. The shore was steep, and once I got the canoe to move with its own weight, it slid down the path and into the water. The sun was in the west when I left the shore. The sea was calm behind the high cliffs. Using the two-bladed paddle, I quickly skirted the south part of the island. As I reached the sand spit, the wind struck. I was paddling from the back of the, the canoe, because you can go faster kneeling there, but I could not handle it in the wind. Kneeling in the middle of the canoe, I paddled hard and did not pause until I had gone through the tides that run fast around the sand spit. There were many small waves, and I was soon wet, but as I came out from behind the spit, the spray lessened and the waves grew long and rolling. Though it would have been easier to go the way they slanted, this would have taken me in the wrong direction. I therefore kept them on my left hand as well as the island, which grew smaller and smaller behind me. At dusk, I looked back. The island of the blue dolphins had disappeared. This was the first time that I had felt afraid. There were only hills and valleys of water around me now. When I was in a valley, I could see nothing. And when the canoe rose up out of it, only the ocean stretching away and away. Night fell and I drank from the basket. The water cooled my throat. The sea was black and there was no difference between it and the sky. The waves made no sound among themselves, only faint noises as they went under the canoe or struck against it. Sometimes the noises seemed angry, and at other times like people laughing. I was not hungry because of my fear. The first star made me feel less afraid. It came out low in the sky, and it was in front of me, toward the east. Other stars began to appear all around, but it was this one I kept my gaze upon. It was in the figure that we call a serpent, a star which shone green and which I knew. Now and then it was hidden by mist, yet it always came out brightly again. Without this star, I would have been lost, for the waves never changed. They came always from the same direction and in a manner that kept pushing me away from the place I wanted to reach. For this reason, the canoe made a path in the black water like a snake, but somehow I kept moving toward the star which shone in the east. This star rose high, and then I kept the north star on my left hand, the one we call the star that does not move. The wind grew quiet, since it always died down when the night was half over. I knew how long I had been traveling and how far away the dawn was. About this time, I found that the canoe was leaking. Before dawn, I had emptied one of the baskets in which food was stored and used it to dip out the water that came over the sides. The water that now moved around my knees was not from the waves. Okay, and we are going to stop there for today. So I know today is technically our last day of school, but I have promised... We, over here, we will finish reading Island of the Blue Dolphin until we finish it. I will plan to continue to read on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And uh, I will post, um, well, we can talk about it in our meeting. I'll either post it on my website, as I have been, which you can all find. Um, that's probably where I'll put it. That'll be the easiest. So I will make a new, a new tab that just says Island of the Blue Dolphin, so you can all go find that there, okay? All right, well, I hope to see you today at 4 o'clock for our last class hangout meet. Um, if you do by chance see me today, remember we have to follow the rules and stay apart, um, but you might see me drop something by to your house. So I miss you all. I've had the best year. It's been wonderful. So thank you for welcoming me to your school. Thank you for making me feel like a special, wonderful teacher. I appreciate all of you. wish we could give each other a hug. Uh, I'm sure Moosey does too. So, from both of us, um, I hope I see you at four.